everyone and welcome to our DFM for CNC machining webinar today. We're just waiting for everyone to trickle into the meeting room. And so as you're joining, uh, if you can please uh, post in the chat the main thing that you're looking to get out of today's webinar, um, that will be really great for us to get a sense of what you want to learn today. Um, you know, we really want this to be an interactive discussion that answers the top questions that you have, you know, to make sure that this information is as valuable as possible. So go ahead and you can post in the chat. Um, you can toggle it to all panelists and attendees. If you want to introduce yourself uh, to the group as well. So my name is Christine Evans. I'm the Director of Product Marketing and Content here at Fictive. Um, we have some great uh, content that we're really excited to share with you today. So we're just gonna go ahead and get started in one minute here. I also want to acknowledge that today is Veterans Day. And so if there's any veterans joining us today um, on behalf of all of us here and all of us at Fictive, uh, thank you so much for your service. Great, thanks Dean for uh, posting the chat. Looking to learn uh, introduction to best practices for designing for CNC um, done by an outside CM. Dan is sharing, you know, when to consider moving away from CNC machining is one of the things he's looking to learn. That's great, thank you. Um, and you can also, um, I wanna say that you can post in the Q&A module, you'll see that in the Zoom webinar. Um, so any questions that come up, we want this to be interactive. So go ahead and post your questions there um, instead of in the chat, because then all of the registrants will be able to see the questions and you can actually also upvote other people's questions. And we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to make sure that we try and um, address questions. So please put your questions in into the Q&A module. All right, so I also want to let everyone know that um, the content we're going to cover in today's <clears throat> webinar is a part of a brand new three-part masterclass series in the Fictive Resource Center. Um, so today we're covering the first module of this masterclass, and then there are two additional modules and also webinars that we're going to be hosting that you can register for um, that cover um, DFM for greater complexity designs. So it's completely open and free to take this masterclass at your own self-guided pace. And at the end, you can also uh, take a knowledge test and earn a masterclass badge to show off your skills. So I'm going to go ahead and post that link. Um, um, in the chat here as well so that you can check that out um, after the webinar is done. So I'm thrilled today to introduce you to our amazing speakers who are going to be um, walking you through these DFM for CNC machining topics. Uh, first off, we're joined by Mike Barton, who is the head of mechanical engineering at Synapse Product Development. So thank you so much, Mike, for being here. Um, please share a bit more about Synapse and also about your background for the audience. Yeah, thanks so much, Christine, for inviting me. Yeah, Synapse is a product design firm. You know, we do product development in all sorts of different industries. Personally, I've been with Synapse for six years now and worked on all sorts of different projects from, you know, consumer to medical to industrial. Before that, I actually have about 30 years of experiment experience in product development. I started at Canon and then Hewlett Packard doing laser jet and inkjet development. Moved on to a company called Alcon Labs, which was surgical equipment for retina surgery. Came to San Francisco with the America's Cup, which is a big yacht race. And then, uh, and then from there, I went to Synapse. So yeah, thanks so much for having me and hopefully this is helpful to everyone. Great, thanks Mike. And we're also joined by David Mayer, who is Senior Technical Project Manager uh, here at Fictive. So thanks David so much for joining us. Um, please also share a bit about your role and your background as well. Yeah, I uh, came to Fictive as sort of the, the longest job I've had. I've been here for about uh, three years, worked in a machine shop and at a big uh, welding, welder manufacturer before this, but um, I work at Fictive on the uh, kind of US uh, self-service CNC side of the parts that you order through the website, uh, getting those once they're ordered actually manufactured within our network of shops, um, making sure things go well and making sure we are able to uh, easily manage everything. Um, and then also uh, like to come and help out marketing as much as I can on 
things like this masterclass and kind of share back a lot of the, the learnings we've got from um, all the parts we make. So super excited for this, uh, the kickoff, this masterclass. It's a good distillation of a lot of, a lot of learnings we've had. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, so just quickly to cover the uh, agenda that we're going to um, go over in today's webinar. So this is the first module of this DFM for CNC machining masterclass. And we're going to be introducing you to this concept of manufacturing effort. So, you know, beyond the binary do's and don'ts of manufacturing and DFM, where, you know, you first learn, okay, what can be manufactured and what can't be manufactured, we're going to add another layer of nuance into that to really help you understand how design choices impact CNC machining effort at different levels and across different parameters. So we're going to be covering this least effort rule set for CNC machining um, across tolerances, geometry, material, and part size, and also look and feel, and then share some of the, the key principles to keep in mind across each of those parameters, and then also give you some um, key design and project examples so you can start to think about how that applies um, to your own designs as well. And then, as I mentioned, um, we're going to have time for a Q&A at the end. So um, any questions that you have specific to your project or your work, um, hopefully we can address those in the webinar today as well. All right, so just to kick things off, we also want to start off with a poll to really just understand, um, you know, where people are coming from today. So the question is, what is your level of experience with DFM for CNC machining? You know, are you just becoming familiar with it, um, introduced to the topic? Have you been working through DFM maybe on a few projects? Do you work with DFM, you know, each and every day, or you know, do you feel like maybe you have a certain level of mastery? Um, we want to make sure that this is, um, we're, you know, we're gauging it for for the right audience here. You know, Mike, I know that you work with a lot of different engineers at Synapse. You probably um, also have varying levels of DFM experience, but I know that throughout all your work, um, DFM is is really important in the product design work that you do. It is, and, and you know. Most people think of DFM is only for mass production parts, but it, especially in CNC, it applies to every volume that you're working with. You know, for the high volume parts, obviously reducing uh, machine time uh, saves you a lot of time and money. But even if you just have a one-off part, you know, and you're trying to do a quick experiment, it could make the difference between getting your part in a day or two or getting your part in a week or two. So. Yeah, it really applies to all production volumes. Yeah, I've definitely seen cases where, you know, a well-designed one-off, it'll be much easier and go much smoother, quickly, cheaper than a poorly designed quantity, 10, 20, 30 of something. Right. All right, I'm just going to share out what uh, the results are saying here. So it looks like the majority of people joining, you know, they worked through DFM issues on a few projects. And then a split between, you know, people who are working with DFM often um, and people who are maybe just becoming familiar with it. So certainly um, a range of experiences. And, you know, hopefully I think with the content today, even if you have some fundamentals, you know, we can help you really think about um, up leveling that knowledge um, to become more strategic with your DFM for CNC. All right, great. Well, at this point, um, David, I'm going to pass it off to you to introduce this concept of uh, manufacturing effort. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and just kind of start uh, a little basic, but the, the basic idea of, you know, what is designed for manufacturing is to make your part manufacturable in, in this context by CNC. Uh, anything can be made if you have the right tools. We're just focusing on can you make it with, a, um, with machining? Um, so there's, you know, the, the manufacturable zone and kind of then an unmanufacturable zone and the, the basic ideas of, you know, what, uh, separates this, the basic concepts you learn in like a freshman mechanical engineering class are things like, you know, you can't make a square hole, right? You need fillets in the corners for the end mill or, you know, making some that's really like a long and narrow pocket is hard. Blind holes can be difficult if you're trying to tap them. There's basic things like that that just are a pretty obvious line between manufacturable and unmanufacturable. Uh, but this doesn't really capture the, the kind of in-between, right? If 
there's something that yes, it's manufacturable, but it's not easy. You can manufacture it, but should you make it, should you make it that way? Um, and so we're gonna kind of introduce this idea of manufacturing effort. And this is the kind of guiding idea for this webinar, this course, the whole series of webinars of uh, calling manufacturing effort a measure of kind of how much time, care, effort, and challenge is needed to manufacture some kind of design. Um, and why this is important is because, you know, there's, if you have lower effort, you'll have uh, a quicker lead time, less risk to your design, less costs. You'll, it'll, things will just go smoother for both you and the manufacturer and everyone ends up happier. Um, and then, so to break this down even a little further, we're gonna look at kind of five different spokes, different areas within manufacturability and DFM that kind of define uh, what go into making a part manufacturable. So there's the geometry of the part, kind of you know how it's shaped, what types of setups it needs, what type of surfaces it has, the, uh, the tolerance that you add to the part, um, the, the look and feel and kind of the cosmetic and like surface finish requirements, the material it's made out of, you know, is it steel, is it plastic, is it aluminum? And then finally kind of the part size, like how big is your finished part? How big is the billet you need to make it out of? Um, and so these all kind of then are, have a, uh, in each one you can think of as an axis, right? There's kind of inside, there's at the zero, there's the least effort option. And then as you kind of increase in effort, uh, you get close to that unmanufacturable zone for each individual spoke. So, you know, tolerance, if you have a really loose tolerance, that's least effort. You have a really tight tolerance that's close to unmanufacturable. You have plus or minus, you know, one tenth of an inch or one tenth of a thousandth of an inch, that's probably unmanufacturable. Um, and so if you kind of map a part to the different areas, you can kind of characterize how difficult it is to make. So something that's, you know, like a crazy aerospace part, most of these attributes are going to be in kind of the maximum effort zone. Um, today, though, we're just going to focus on the, the center, the kind of least effort just to start and lay out, you know, better describe kind of what these different attributes are, how to think about them, and then kind of what constitutes uh, least effort for each one of these. Um, so you can kind of think about like, okay, if I want to make the simplest part, uh, what does that, how do I do that? And that doesn't just mean, you know, a uh, plate with holes is the simplest part. So everything we're going to make is a plate with holes because that's not feasible. It's more about um, kind of how do you apply some ideas for each one of these to make your part the least effort version of itself. Uh, and so right. go ahead and hand over to Mike to kind of start with the first one, which is the geometry. Just how's the thing look? Yeah, so with all of these sort of rules we're looking at, all these spokes, there are many things that can be done, but we're gonna really focus today on the things where you get the biggest bang for the buck, sort of like the top three or four general rules to follow. So with geometry, I'd say number one is when you're designing your part, think about how it's gonna go into the CNC machine and try to make it so there's a maximum of two setups. And when I say setup, I mean when it gets put in the machine and clamped down and, and located. Every time you do that, that's sort of a manual process that takes a lot of time uh, and takes an operator to do it and drives up the cost. Um, design around a stock geometry. The good news is stock geometry comes in all sorts of different shapes. You know, the standard bars and rods and tubes but also in hexes and H-beams and I-beams. If you can take your part and make the basic dimensions and tolerances the same as the stock part, then that is a surface that does not need to be machined. That's gonna save on machine time. Uh, that's really gonna cut down the cost. Uh, remove as little material as possible. So kind of seems like a no brainer, but let's say you have a, a simple rod and with two flats, a flat in each end that has a feature that's important. Um, you know, you could just machine the whole surface to that one, to that one height, or you could have a cut on each end. Um, 
by just having the cut on each end, you're again, you're significantly cutting down the machine time, tool wear, all sorts of things. So try to try to remove as little as material as possible. And then the last is designing and work holding features. So this sort of works in conjunction with uh, the maximum of two setups as well. If maybe in the first setup, you can design in features that are used to locate or hold the part in the, in the following feature, that'll save a lot of time. If it, if it takes, if you create, uh, you know, if you don't have these work holding features, again, you're gonna make it difficult to put in, to clamp down and to zero the part. So this is a good example of, you know, kind of the simplest example we could find of, uh, of a part. Um, and your initial look at this, you know, A and B, it looks like A is a simpler part, but in fact, B is much easier to machine. So with A, it actually would take three setups to machine this part. You would lay the part down flat and you would cut the hole because there's no release in those corners. You'd have to rotate the part 90 degrees, cut one of those slots, take it out, rotate it 180 degrees, cut the other slot. So that's again, that's an operator that's uh, clamping it down, that's zeroing the machine every time. Um, so obviously that adds a lot of time, adds a lot of expense. The other thing that this does is it, it decreases accuracy. Um, every time you have to reset up, you add more error into the location. When you look at the object B, all you have to do is put the machine, put the piece down on the work table, clamp it down and run the program. All of the features can be cut in one setup. So that's gonna make reduce cycle time, that's going to reduce operator time. And it's also going to give you a much more accurate part uh, since tolerances can be held much tighter within a single setup. Cool. So I'll go ahead and take kind of the next spoke uh, on the wheel, uh, which is the, the size of the part, um, which, you know, pretty self-explanatory is how just how big is your part, right? Does it fit in a shoebox? Does it fit in a shipping container? Um, so in general, if you want to kind of keep part like least effort as easy to do as possible, you don't want your part too big, you don't want it too small. Uh, so that means you want to take kind of like the longest side, whatever the largest part uh, dimension of your part is, you want to try and keep that generally less than six inches. Um, just because that's easy to handle, it's easy to pick up. Uh, also a standard machining vice is six inches. So that means you're guaranteed to just fit in whatever vice the machinist already has in their machine. They don't necessarily need to set up any special fixtures or anything like that. Um, on the flip side, though, you don't want to make your part too small. Uh, generally, we'd say try and keep things greater than like three inches along your smallest dimension, uh, because if parts start getting too small, uh, even though they're you know weight-wise easy to carry, if it's like really tiny, it's going to be easy to drop, hard to keep track of. Uh, also, it's going to become just weaker. There's less material. And so you need to be a lot more careful with how you clamp it, how you inspect it. It's just kind of easier to mess up something that's really small and delicate. Uh, so kind of keeping a part in that zone makes it really easy to just uh, get manufactured. The stock size is also probably readily available, which is something to really strongly consider, uh, particularly if you're going to the extremes of stuff. Uh, obviously, you can always make a small part out of a bigger piece of stock. But if you're trying to make something really big, there might not be stock available, uh, particularly for things like plastics generally don't come very thick. Um, and so looking online to make sure that, hey, this is material that's not only available, but also kind of readily available. Um, and generally within this envelope uh, will help. Um, and then finally, if you can leave a part at stock thickness or stock dimensions. So if I'm just making, you know, a fixture plate, it's just some holes, the holes need to be located correctly, but the thickness doesn't matter. Uh, don't require that, you know, both sides of that, your plate be face down, just leave it at, you know, whatever thickness the stock comes at, that saves the machinist uh, an operation and another tool that they don't have to face down um, with. So to kind of go on to an example of that, um, and also this kind of interplays with geometry a bit, uh, which shows, I should mention top, all of these kind of have some bit of interplay with them, 
but here's just a really a simple part uh, tube with some sides on the end. You know, it's uh, aluminum, no tight tolerances. It's within kind of a, a pretty easy size range. And so if I, uh, the way I size this part can kind of impact how easy it is to make. If I size it uh, so that it's, uh, there's some matching stock readily available. There's, you know, I can go to McMaster and I have a tube. They have a tube that's the same outer diameter, the same inner diameter. This is a super easy part to make. You just drop the stock in a vise with some soft jaws or a V-block, machine those two little dishes on the end, and you're set. Easiest thing ever. But if, you know, the outer diameter, the inner diameter aren't quite the same size of the stock, they have a special tolerance, a special, uh, you know, surface finish requirement, then suddenly you need to put this on a lathe. Uh, it requires multiple machines, becomes much more expensive. And so kind of trying to keep in mind really the stock, both the size of it, uh, you know, how easy it is to move around um, and also how well it fits within the material you're using can really make a big difference um, within how easy it is to make a part. All right, the next spoke we're gonna talk about is material. So that's one of the first decisions you make whenever you're making a part and it's pretty, pretty impactful when it comes to CNC machining. So a wise old machinist once told me that, that uh, if you can make your part out of plastic, you know, make it out of plastic and specifically make it out of Delrin or Astel, uh, it has a lot of different names. Astel is nice because it's naturally lubricious. Uh, it doesn't need coolant. It cuts really easily. Uh, the chips clear well and it's relatively stiff, so you get good features. He said, if you can't make it out of plastic, make it out of aluminum. Um, and aluminum obviously is a very good thermal conductor. It moves the heat away from the cutting surface very quickly, uh, and specifically make it out of 6061. Now, there's other materials, other aluminums that are actually easier to machine than 6061. But 6061 is so readily available and so expensive. And all the machinists use that for building their own fixtures. They're very familiar with working with it. They know all the settings. Uh, so it is the preferred material for machining for almost every, every uh, CNC operation. Now, there's always the situation where you need something a little harder and you need to make it out of steel and not aluminum. And uh, if you need to make it out of steel, try to stick with 1018 steel. So it's formulated and, and processed specifically for machining. Actually, uh, all materials have the machinability uh, rating to them. And 1018 is the benchmark. It has a rating of one. So everything else is, uh, is sort of based on that. So if it has to be steel, 1018. So this is an example, and you know, you talk about different materials, and especially with plastics, of what's easy and what's not, and it's and it's not obvious until you actually machine it yourself. So I had this, uh, I had this project I was working on. It was a cap touch sensor, and these aren't the actual parts, but uh, but it was a very kind of high feel, high touch part. And so I designed the part, and I created the tool path, and didn't have any Astel in stock, so we ordered some Astel. But I figured while I was waiting, I might as well just use what we had in stock and run the program and make sure it ran okay. Yeah, and I put it in the CNC and ran it. it and it, you know, the toolpath worked fine and it cut okay, but it, it wasn't beautiful. All right, so anyway, uh, yeah, the toolpath worked, but the, you know, it, it didn't look great and there was a lot of uh, sort of not cleared material. And so I, you know, I did a little bit to tune it here and there, and it just didn't have the best surface finish. It started getting late. And so I came back the next day and the, uh, and the asphalt came in, I dropped it in the machine, ran the program and it just came out looking beautiful. So, uh, you know, if you ever order an asphalt part, usually you'll get it and the thing will come in great. So uh, it's just a pleasure to work with this stuff. The next spur we're gonna talk about is uh, tolerance. And there's a, actually a really good guide for tolerance. It's the ISO 2768. And it has three different ratings. It has uh, coarse, medium, and fine. And it, it's a really good guide to know what tolerances are easily held with CNC machining, specifically for CNC. 
And so, you know, you can, it's easy to look up that online. You can find it anywhere. Um, follow those, especially if you can stay in that, you know, the course or medium, it's going to really keep the uh, part price down on your part. The other thing you need to do is only put tight tolerances on critical to function dimensions. People have a tendency to, you know, they put a tight tolerance on one dimension and then they just say, okay, well, I'll use that everywhere on the drawing. And obviously, you know, that's making a difficult situation for each feature on, uh, on the drawing and it, it'll drive up the cost. Um, and keep tight tolerances within a single setup. I mentioned this earlier. Obviously, every time you set up the machine, set up the, your workpiece, you need to relocate it on the machine, you need to re-zero it, uh, and you're adding error in there. And so your part's gonna be, gonna be much uh, more accurately held if you can keep those tight tolerances and you can design it so that if you do have a tight tolerance, that that is cut within a single setup. So this is a super simple, sort of the simplest example we could come up with for this. This is just a flat plate, and in this particular application, what is critical to the function here is the distance between the two holes. So if you look at the drawing on the left, the logic here is, well, I'm going to locate this part, uh, you know, in the CNC machine on the bottom edge and that left-hand edge. And so I'm going to, I'm going to dimension and tolerance from there. So, you know, from my datum in zero point. Um, and here, you know, you needed to hold the tight tolerance. And so you, you're in that, fine area with a plus or minus 0.15 and on the five dimension in the fine area we've got plus or minus 0.1 so that's again takes more attention longer cycle times to to uh produce that the drawing on the right made a couple just a couple changes one because you know that it's not critical the distance from the hole to the edge is not critical we loosen the tolerance considerably on that so that's plus or minus 0.5 and we actually loosen the tolerance between the two holes to plus or minus 0.2. This puts it in that medium range. Now, in reality, the distance between the two holes is held more tightly on the drawing on the right. Um, it's at plus or minus 0.2. The drawing on the left, it's plus or minus 0.25. So how you dimension it makes a big difference. You can actually loosen the dimensions by dimensioning specifically what you care about um, you can you can get more consistent parts. Now, another key feature here is because there is that loose tolerance on the edges, if you were going to make a bunch of these, um, the subsequent parts, you could just, they could, uh, when they machine these, they could just put stops on the work table. And they push the work piece and push it against the stops, clamp it down and run the program, and there'd be no need to zero and reprobe the device that's going to save a lot of money so again the part on the right just by uh, just by the tolerancing dimensioning and tolerancing scheme you are able to really reduce the amount of cycle time uh the amount of operator time and drive down the cost quite a bit cool and uh, that brings us to our third and final spoke um which is kind of the the look and feel of the part um and this is uh, an attribute that seems pretty uh, simple, where it's generally kind of what comes last of like, unless I'm making something that, you know, is designed to be a really cosmetic looking part, like on the outside of something, uh, you don't think as look and feel as something that adds a lot of effort, uh, but there are ways it, it really can, um, and that thinking about will really help kind of make a difference in your part. Uh, the, the biggest kind of contribute to, contributor to this is uh, fillets and radii in your part. Um, so there's, as I said, the kind of standard uh, learning when you're a freshman is, you know, you can't make a sharp or a square hole with sharp internal corners because on a mill, because you need radii for the tool. You can have very tiny radii that maybe it doesn't matter, but they can't be sharp, um, which is simple enough. But uh, kind of thinking about, okay, so there are radii in any design that are kind of intrinsic to the part. There need to be radii there. Uh, so modeling those in both for you and the machinist is uh, very helpful. Also considering giving them, making those radii as large as possible. Um, larger tools are much easier to cut with. They're stiffer. 
And so like in this part, you can see there's those radii on the internal corner. And you know, if those are half inch uh, radii, this is a really easy part to just, you know, hog out with a big tool and cut versus if those are, you know, 16th inch radii, that becomes much harder to machine and just saying, you know, oh, well, I wanted a sharp corner. So I'll just put a really tiny radius. That's fine. Is some that, yeah, that impacts the look and feel of the part, but can also greatly impact the uh, amount of time it takes to make the part and the amount of effort. And so being as uh, kind of uh, large with your radii as you can uh, is a really great way to uh, make your part uh, kind of lower effort. Um, and so if on the next slide, uh, we'll see there's the other way radii come up are if you have kind of like compound edges um, or it's called 3D machining is the usual term. As some people call like ball tracking, um, profiling, just when you basically have to make a, a curved or a ramped surface um, on a three axis mill and you have to run the tool back and forth in successive passes to get that shape. So making sure to add radii where needed, like shown here, once again, making those radii as big as possible. Also kind of being cognizant of the surface finish requirements on these surfaces. Uh, when you're 3D machining something, the surface is always gonna be scalloped because you're trying to make a straight edge with a round tool with a ball. And so there's gonna be these little kind of wave shapes if you really zoomed in. Uh, so being giving the basically the roughest, uh, the lowest surface finish um, that you can in, uh, in any drawings or requirements also is a really good way to kind of allow a machine to say, okay, if, if this surface doesn't matter, I can have a really rough surface finish. I don't have to do as many passes with a ball end mill to get it really fine and really reduce the scalloping. Uh, if that doesn't matter, that can make a world of difference in a part. Um, we at Victive see radii and fillets are probably the thing I'm talking about the most with machinists when it comes to uh, DFM and kind of getting parts made. Um, and so kind of the other side uh, that I've mentioned a couple times, but with look and feel is also the actual uh, surface roughness and kind of sur look and surface finish of the part. Um, so all parts have tool paths on them that are going to be visible for machining. So uh, having areas where you can leave those, uh, just basically leaving your part as machined is the simplest way. No post-processing, no extra effort needed for things like that. Um, if you need just a certain part like the outside to look really clean, you can call out on those surfaces, you know, I need this smoother, I need this media blasted, I need this polished, whatever, but the inside can be fine. Um, specifying things like that, or just if only a certain surface needs a specific tool path for looks, calling out things like that. And once again, allowing for kind of the roughest surface possible. Um, makes things a lot easier, reduces the need for finishing passes on the mill or finishing processes or really, you know, heavy deburring and post-processing. Um, so to kind of round this out, I'll share my, uh, an old machinist once told me story, uh, except I won't call him old uh, to be nice to him. But uh, when I was first effective, he called me up and said, hey, I, I'm working on this part. Uh, and it's giving me some trouble. I'm like, well, it looks really simple. What's wrong? It's like, well, I've been seeing this a lot. I've been in the business, you know, so long. Then I see this more and more as they, they took this part and it looks like they just did control A. They selected the whole part and then pulled up the fillet tool and said, just add, add a fillet. Um, and that's really easy to do in CAD. Uh, you can do it in about three clicks in Fusion. It makes the part look really nice. It makes it look kind of, you know, real because uh, most parts have broken edges. But it adds a lot of requirements to the machinist of, you know, on external radii, they have to either 3D machine them or use like a round over radius tool, which are really tricky to use internally. Suddenly that can make, you know, on this part, the little radii in those pockets are going to be really tough to make. You need a really long, skinny tool. And so even though it's really easy to do that, to make a, your part look pretty as a designer, being very intentional and saying, okay, these things actually need a radius and it needs it for a reason. So I'll put one there is good. And then for anything else, just leaving a note on the drawing that says, you know, break sharp edges, um, putting chamfers instead of radii, which are much easier to machine, could even be done by hand with a file, uh, will make a part much easier. And kind of once again, just focusing on the 
being intentional with these are the things I need and the features I need and leaving the other ones open uh, to whatever is fits in the process will make the part uh, require much less effort. Great. Thank you so much, David and Mike, for covering, you know, those main um, five parameters to consider for least effort machining. Um, so we've got some good questions that have come in. Um, maybe to start off with, um, you know, Malcolm is asking, does the concept of least effort only apply to simple design? So maybe you can, uh, David, can you touch on like how to think about complexity as it relates to least effort here? Yeah, because the, and well, we, a lot of people in this webinar are trying to be specific with their own, they have like, okay, complex. And in, that means something different for everyone. Um, and so we're, we're trying to kind of stay from saying the word complex here, because this really isn't a question of complexity. It's a question of effort. Um, and as I said in the beginning, trying to make a part the least effort version of itself. Uh, so the, the short answer is no, you can have a very complex part that is still least effort uh, version of it. It has all these, you know, crazy 3D machine surfaces and, you know, lofted features and uh, tight tolerances and small radii and all those are needed. Those are necessary for the design, but you can still be very intentional with adding, okay, this one surface, you know, surface finish doesn't matter. This radii size can be whatever. This tolerance can be pretty loose relative to the surface and doing things like that take a part that is very complex, but still kind of the least effort version of itself. Uh, a lot of examples here we used our quote unquote simple parts just kind of for sake of uh, making it easy to understand, but uh, this can apply to any part you make it where you can have the least effort version, you can have the maximum effort version, and you can even have the unmanufacturable version of it. Great, thanks. Um, okay, Joe is asking, uh, what resources are available for figuring out which part characteristics make parts more challenging or expensive to machine? You know, how do you know which process needs to be used for each feature? And how do you know when your design necessitates the use of less common or more expensive machinery like gun drilling, EDM, et cetera? Um, a lot to unpack in this question. Mike, do you maybe want to um, start off? Yeah, there's lots of different resources available. Um, you know, one thing that I mentioned is the, you know, for tolerances that ISO 2768. So, you know, that'll tell you what tolerances are easily held and which aren't. Uh, in terms of other processes, boy, there's numerous things out there. You know, there's numerous resources on CNC machining, just even searching the web, you can actually get most of your questions answered. Um, there are some basic books on it. And there's some basic rules of thumb. It's like when you talk about, you know, gun drilling, that's obviously for a very high aspect ratio, a very long thin hole. Generally, like I try to keep the aspect ratio 10 to one or less to make sure that it can be cut. Um, EDM, you know, I think if you follow the rules that you that that we're sharing here, you're gonna you're gonna be able to stay very easily within the the CNC realm. Some of the follow-on uh, webinars that we're going to hold are going to talk about these difficult or these more fringe areas. Obviously, today we're just covering that how to make it more economical. Um, yeah, and I think one of the things that David mentioned is yeah, no. If you make a square hole, obviously you can't CNC that. You're going to have to EDM it. Um, obviously, when you're making something like an injection mold, there's going to be features that are going to be machined, and there's going to be features that are going to have to be EDM'd. Um, it's just following those basic rules of machining. Ho hopefully I was able to answer, uh, you know, the question there. I'll, I'll even add on a bit just to kind of drive it home is, uh, and not to keep plugging the, the webinar we're in, but, uh, there are a lot of great resources, but also finding them all and kind of condensing them is, is tough. I've never found a good singular one. So the actual like, uh, kind of text version of the masterclass that goes along with these webinars, uh, we tried to really tease out a lot of numbers around those rules that we've found. Like, you know, Mike said the 10 to one aspect ratio, that's a pretty common knowledge for like, how long should your tool be? But it's kind of hard to find it written down somewhere. So look for things like that there. Um, another resource is 
just kind of simply McMaster Carr, uh, which uh, some people live by as like a Bible. And basically, if if they have a tool that can make it, if they have material that can make it, there's a good chance it can be done. If they don't, uh, you could check something like Harvey Tool. And if they don't have it, then it maybe can't be made. So if you're looking at a feature and like, oh, is there a tool that can do this? You know, check McMaster, check Harvey Tool. If they've got a tool that'll fit, it might be doable. You got a shot. If they don't have the tool, that's a pretty good sign. It's, it might not be doable with uh, conventional machining. And also, I, I have to say, you know, check with your, your shop, whoever's doing the CNC machining with you. They are, they're, every single machine shop is happy to work with you on DFM up front. It's going to make their life easier. It's going to make your life easier. So if you have a question, I, I would not be shy in reaching out to, uh, reaching out to your shop, whoever you're using. Yeah, I would emphasize that as well. I think, you know, even when you understand the principles of DFM, getting that guided expertise on, on a part basis, you know, and collaborating with your manufacturing partner. Um, and, you know, if you are using the Fixit platform to order parts, um, every part that's uploaded to the platform gets free DFM feedback. And that is auto-generated um, through the platform, but also comes from our manufacturing engineers um, on our team who, you know, um, are experts in understanding uh, manufacturing effort for CNC machining. So um, that's a resource available as well. Um, okay, so Harsh is asking, um, in the whole example, why are you not using GD&T positioning tolerance uh, for whole position? Um, Mike, I think maybe this was yeah. related to one of your slides. Yeah, and so the reason we didn't use GD&T is just for, because we're trying to make a simple example here. GD&T is terrific. It actually takes a lot of these things, you know, it, it, it's gonna minimize the amount of variation um, for critical features. Uh, so I highly recommend GD&T. Uh, and the good part is all these basic rules we're talking about today also apply to GD and T where, you know, only putting the tight tolerances on the, on the dimensions you care about, keeping it all within the same setup. It's, it applies, you know, by having the datum for that setup and everything. So yeah, GD and T is great. All these rules apply to it. We just didn't use it today just because we wanted a super, super simple example. Um, great. And so Wayne is also asking, um, usually tight tolerance limits and fits on dowel pin holes or alignment features drive up my part cost. Um, any recommendations for achieving these tight tolerance holes in an economic way? So I guess the uh, I, to kind of reiterate some things you said, and then Mike, if you've got anything new to add, but um, having them size to readily available tools, uh, generally readily available reamers. And so the, the easiest way to reduce the cost of those is um, quick summarize, look on McMaster cart, see if there's reamers available for that size. They have a lot of reamers in like, I think, you know, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.01 inch increments. So make sure there's a reamer that's to that size, call out your tolerance based on the size of that reamer. They can just buy that tool, a lot easier to do. Um, and doesn't require, you know, jig boring or EDM or anything crazy. Um, the other thing is, as Mike mentioned earlier, making sure that the tolerances are relative to each other within the same setup. Uh, mill on its own is super accurate within its own positioning. So if you have the holes positioned relative to each other, it'll get them bang on pretty much from the get-go. If you make these holes tolerance rather relative to non-machined surfaces or surfaces not machined in that setup though, that can make it a lot harder because then you're relying on the positional accuracy of a person who's orienting that part and turns out people aren't quite as accurate as machines. Uh, so those are kind of the two big uh, tips for if you're doing like dowel locating holes and stuff to reduce the cost there. Great, thanks. Um, so I think the maybe the last question we'll try and answer. I remember someone asked, you know, if you could pick one thing, you know, what is the number one risk in CNC machining that um, engineers and product designers should keep top of mind? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say this is uh, not a, a cop out answer, but uh, it, it's not a one thing, but it's, I think, the best answer, which the, the biggest risk is pushing multiple things at once. And so in this webinar, you know, we talked about there's kind of these five 
spokes and five attributes to think about. And so it's not that any one is necessarily a greater risk than the other. The biggest risk is trying to push on multiple of these spokes at once. Um, right? Having tight tolerances isn't necessarily a big risk. Having a big part isn't necessarily a big risk. Having some that's kind of you know thin and a lot of curved surfaces isn't necessarily a big risk. But trying to do all of those at once and have some that's big, tight tolerance, thin walls, you know, 3D machined, and you want a super shiny mirror surface finish, that's that's risky. Um, and so being very cognizant of like what I've said before of what do I need? What are the, the basic things I need? And minimizing how many different things you're trying to get out of a part uh, is really the the easiest way and reduces the risk because in machining pretty much everything comes back to time and time is money. And so the, the less you're trying to get a part to do it once, the less time it will take, the less focus it will take, the less risk it will have, the more time there'll be to recover if something extraneous goes wrong. Uh, so that's kind of, I'd say, is thinking about all these attributes and reducing how many of them you're trying to push at once. Yeah. Anything you would add to that, Mike, or any kind of final words of wisdom? No, I think David actually nailed it there. You know, we talked about keep trying to keep things in that center core of, you know, least least effort to manufacture. And, you know, if you punch, you know, push out in one area, you can, can compensate. But yeah, when you have a multitude of these things, it makes it really tough. So I think it was a perfect answer. All right, so you know some key takeaways. What can uh, you know the audience take away and keep top of mind um, from the content in today's webinar? Yeah, so just to kind of put it in a sentence or two, the your designs have, you know, there's relative effort in each design, and there's kind of different zones of you can have least effort up to maximum effort. And just keeping in mind, like where where am I falling in general on this part? Is this high effort? Is this low effort part? Um, in general, keep that in mind. And then within that, think about kind of then, okay, within each area, you know, or how's the effort relative to my tolerances, to the geometry I'm designing, to the size of my part, to the material I'm using, to the look and feel I'm requiring, and kind of keep those five things in mind. Yeah, and you know, you're not gonna be able to do that all the time with, with every part, but you start with these least effort rules. And if you can apply them, you do. Uh, in cases where you can't, then you can add effort you know, for that feature as it's needed. Great. Well, we do have um, some more webinars coming up that we're really excited about that we hope you can join us for. Um, apologies again for some of the technical difficulties today, but I'm, I'm sure we can work those things out. So the first one coming up is next Thursday. Um, we're gonna be hosting a builds and banter session with Mike and with David. Um, builds and banters are really fun. They're more interactive and we actually invite you to join Zoom with your video and your audio on if you wish, so that it's more of kind of a, a round table conversation with everyone joining. So there um, we'll invite you to bring your project specific questions and David and Mike will have some more specific examples around this topic of DFM for CNC machining. So please join us there. Um, and then also we'll have our next webinar for module two of the CNC um, masterclass. DFM for CNC. So we're going to be joined then um, on Wednesdays, December 2nd by Swetha, um, one of our amazing manufacturing engineers at Fictive, as well as John Drury, who is a veteran CNC machinist in the industry and from parametric manufacturing. Um, so you can register at uh, fictive.com slash webinars um, to, to join us then. So thank you so much, Mike and David for joining us with your expertise. Um, you know, finally, I'll say that in terms of resources, Synapse is an amazing resource for DFM and for product design as a whole. So, you know, if you're looking to um, have a partner that can really consult with you on your designs, um, I know the, the team there would be more than happy to hear from you. So you can um, get more information about Synapse and um, reach out at their website. Um, and also, you know, for DFM feedback, you can rely 
rely on the Fictive platform. So it's free to set up an account. And with every part uploaded to the Fictive platform, you'll get that DFM along with your quote. And our manufacturing engineers are also on standby to consult with you and make sure that um, your designs are as optimized as possible. So thank you so much. And hopefully we will see you soon at the next webinar. Thanks, everyone. See y'all then. Thanks, Bye. everyone.